Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here in the forum of the group Exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells and Batteries. We are talking about a world record now. It's the world's largest PEM electrolyzer we were talking about. It's uh, hydrogen for refinery applications, building the world's largest PEM electrolyzer. And I'm very happy to have with me here on stage the Chief Technology Officer of ITM Power, Dr. Simon Bourne. Here he is. Please give him a big hand. Simon, good to have you here. Good to see you. Nice so every one of you is invited to participate in this uh, talk. Please have a seat. There's still some seats left. And whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. Simon, uh, ITM Power is very well known for uh, manufacturing electrolyzers. We can see them right over there. There's a big electrolyzer over there in the container. Uh, and uh, you provide clean fuel for transport and uh, power to gas solutions uh, for grid stabilization. But there are more exciting opportunities for green hydrogen, aren't they? I think that's right. Our, our focus historically has been on uh, clean fuel and energy storage but the world uses huge volumes of hydrogen in industrial applications. And one of the things that struck us um, coming to this fair over uh, what I think... To hold a little bit closer, thank sorry, you. Yeah. Eight or nine years we've been, uh, we've been coming here, and um, w every year people are asking for larger and larger systems. And um, we're delighted to be part of this big project with Shell, um, delivering a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, where the hydrogen is going to be feeding into uh, an existing hydrogen grid on the refinery. So, so re refineries could be the first applications for green hydrogen, which is kind of funny, isn't it? Because in, for refineries, the, the fuel is made for conventional fuels for I, uh, internal combustion engines. So uh, why should we use hydrogen for internal combustion engines? Why not using that directly? Well, um, the refinery where this is going to be located is just outside Cologne, um, and it... Um, it uses around 180,000 tons of hydrogen a year. And it gets that hydrogen from reforming natural gas, which generates CO2 in its production. And the electrolyzer that we're supplying, while it's going to be the biggest of its type, is only going to be providing about 1% of the hydrogen that they need. But what it does do is it offsets the hydrogen that they're generating from reforming natural gas. And that means that they have about 1% of their hydrogen being clean with no CO2 emissions. And that's quite an important thing for them to be able to, uh, to, be able to demonstrate. So you could help to save a lot of CO2 because steam reforming, uh, there's a lot of CO2 coming out. That, that's, that's absolutely right. And this particular refinery in uh, Vesseling is, uh, it makes between 10 and 15% of petrol and diesel for use in Germany. It's Germany's largest refinery. So we are decarbonizing the fuel that's being in, used in Germany today. You need the hydrogen for uh, desulfurizing uh, the, the petrol. Um, the raw oil which comes in has to be desulfurized for, for clean, clean petrol. Um, does it really work or is it just a concept yet? Yeah, that, that, um, that works. They use a lot of hydrogen in the cracking process but also in the desulfurization. And um, perhaps importantly, the, um, the, the need for clean hydrogen on the site is very important and that's paramount for them. But they're also using the electrolyzer to do other jobs on the, on the site. And what it represents for them is a way of modulating the overall power consumption of the refinery. So they have a number of electronic loads that are switching on and off and up and down all throughout the day. And the electrolyzer can automatically modulate so the power consumption of the whole site becomes a much more consistent uh, offtake. And that helps them to negotiate a better power price, essentially, for the entire refinery. So yes, the hydrogen is important, and um, uh, that's the focus. But it's also another instrument through the um, rapid response capabilities of the electrolyzer to help them uh, save money in other areas as well. But that again means also maybe not the hydrogen is the most important thing, but the, to keep the, the amount of energy stable that they uh, uh, get from the grid. Uh, so that's their business case then. That's, that's right. There's a large part to that. And um, as part of this project, we're going to be developing and testing a number of business models. And uh, at the outset, they're going to be targeting existing revenue streams, so offsetting of natural gas and grid balancing services. But they're also going to be looking at... Um, uh, potential 
future revenue streams. And that includes some of the more sophisticated load balancing across the site and potentially even exporting some of the hydrogen to the mobility sector, which is, uh, which is strong here in Germany also. But could you imagine that they also are interested in uh, building even bigger electrolyzers plants to, uh, well, to get more hydrogen, green hydrogen in it than just 1% or even less than 1%? You should have installed one gigawatt, not, not 10 megawatt. We'd be delighted to do that. And uh, in, in fact, it's a very good question because we're being asked um, how credible is it to be able to produce electrolyzers of hundreds, hundreds of megawatts. And this, this project is being used as a, as a mechanism to develop a 10 megawatt stack module and uh, that module can be fairly easily replicated so that you can rapidly reach those, uh, those higher, higher scales. Um, if anybody's particularly interested, we've got some of the modules on our stand so people can have a look and see what they, uh, what they look like. But even for the 10 megawatt, you need two years. As, as far as I know, the, the, the project will only start 2020. Yeah, well, the, the project has, uh, has started, but the, the, it's a five years in, in uh, its initial phase. Uh, the two years of, of that is for the design, uh, manufacture, installation, commissioning and testing at the refinery. And then after that point, the system will go into automated operation for, um, for a five, um, uh, remaining three years. Um, and um, as that project progresses, we're going to be testing the technology, the business cases and also uh, passing on our observations in terms of any barriers that we've found in terms of compliance or regulatory issues that make deploying large electrolyzers a bit more challenging than it might need to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look at the electrolyzer itself. Well, we, we, we can't have it here on stage, it's too big, of course, 10 megawatt of electrolyzer is much too big. But we've prepared a slide uh, that you can have a look at. And so, right in the center you can see the electrolyzer probably, but what's all around it? So. The, the term electrolyzer needs a little bit of definition because it can mean different things to different people. At its heart is the, uh, the PEM stack module itself, which is where the water is split into hydrogen and oxygen. That's the big white box in the middle. But of course, you do have all of the balance of plan around it to make sure that it operates properly and effectively. Um, what we've got in, in essence is, um, is some power conversion electronics. So we're stepping down a high voltage supply and rectifying the AC into DC. We've got water purification, uh, hydrogen purification, and an integrated control system. So Why do you need hydrogen purification? It's just for, for uh, the refinery process. It, that's right. The, the refining process doesn't need very pure hydrogen, mm -hmm. but the decision was made by Shell early on that they wanted to have the capability to export the hydrogen into the mobility sector, where you do need very high pure hydrogen. hydrogen. Where it's much more worthy then. It, it's, it, there's more value. value. And mm -hmm. uh, PEM electrolysis is very good at generating clean hydrogen anyway, because the only impurities you can have are water and oxygen. And so it's relatively straightforward to be able to take those two things out and achieve the ISO standard for fuel cell grade hydrogen. But then you have to compress it as well. Is there a compressor there as well? The, the electrolyzer is generating hydrogen at around 20 bar and that will feed into an existing 19 bar hydrogen pipeline that's used throughout the refinery. Um, we are um, considering uh, bolt-ons to that arrangement so that we could compress and dispatch hydrogen via various means, whether it be compressing into tube trailers or, or other such, uh, such methods. So in Rhineland there is a hydrogen pipeline you just said, uh, where does it go to? Yeah, there's a pipeline uh, in the refinery. So they use oh. so much of the stuff that they have a, a, a pipeline um, uh, running through the heart of the refinery. But it doesn't go to the next uh, hydrogen refilling station in uh, Hurt, for instance. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> not yet but because. there's always a possibility. Yeah, always a possibility. Do you think we will have sooner or later a hydrogen pipeline in Germany, covering all of Germany? Um, there's always the potential. That's a big um, infrastructure project. Um, for us, the way we, think, we see things developing is to have decentralized electrolyzers in the beginning so that you're generating the hydrogen where you need it. And that removes the challenges associated with distributing the hydrogen all around the place and minimizes the amount of hydrogen you need to store at any one time. What we're seeing is applications get larger and the hydrogen demand grows. It's starting to make more sense to have larger centralized electrolyzers that you may then distribute the hydrogen to, uh, to where it's needed. 
Um, I think there's another step again before you have a pipeline. Um, always a possibility, but I think, uh, I think that's a few years away um, from this point. Well, we have to say we had a pipeline of hydrogen, or let's, let's say 50% hydrogen in Germany called Stadtgas uh, in the 50s up to the 70s already, but the, the gas industry took it all and they have to give it back sooner or later probably. Well, that, that's right. And, uh, you know, as, as you know, many of the projects we're involved in are looking at in, uh, injecting hydrogen into the natural gas network again and uh, people do forget that that was quite a common uh, common substance to be moving around through pipelines and uh, the technology is there to do it that's for sure. Simon we we are always talking about power to gas uh, producing hydrogen from renewable energy especially and then where to put the hydrogen Many people say, well, let's put it into the gas grid. Uh, it can take at least two per volume percent, the gas grid, but that's downgrading. So, so I find it quite ex uh, exciting that you use it directly on site. Yeah, so in terms of using um, hydrogen directly in the gas, the gas grid, yeah. Um, I, I, I guess in, in most developed countries, you have the, uh, the power network and the gas network, and what we uh, what we see is that the power network is experiencing a, a very um, a very stark change in its requirements to deal with intermittency so lots of more renewable power being introduced onto the electricity grid and there's no inherent storage of that scale available so the the idea of using power to gas is to use the electrolyzer as a as a transducer to convert electrical energy into a storable chemical energy which you can put inside the existing gas network because there is already the capability to move from the gas grid to the electricity grid using um, uh, gas-fired power stations. So all we're really doing is providing the ability to move in the other direction. We already own gas grids. We, uh, there's a gas grid here in Germany, and there's a gas grid in the UK, and it, they're all very capable of taking huge quantities of hydrogen. So even 2% is a vast, vast quantity. Oh yeah, this is quite a lot, yes. The, the, the gas grid in the UK, I know, is three times the size of the electricity network. So there's, there's plenty of room for spilling out a little bit of excess renewable power into the gas grid. Yeah, and, and I know you're also in a, in a project, in a power to gas project near Frankfurt, uh, where you, uh, um, uh, where you you're also produce uh, the hydrogen from the surplus uh, renewable energy. Uh, there you don't use it in a refinery. Do you, it, this is just for the gas grid then? That, that's right. We've, mm -hmm. got, um, we've done two projects in Germany for power to gas. We're doing a, a third in uh, the UK. And um, the, uh, the principle was, um, was to use the electrolyzer as an instrument to help uh, contribute to a stabilizing service onto the, natural, onto the electricity grid. We qualified um, the equipment for both primary and secondary grid balancing, um, which meant that if the grid required it, the electrolyzer can turn on or turn off very, very quickly um, in less than a second to provide a, um, a, a, a uh, help to the electricity network to balance out its uh, its frequency over a long period of time, and that's quite a uh, a useful thing to be able to do. Um, all of our electrolyzers are capable of responding within within a second. That means that you can uh, get availability payments for providing grid balancing services in the background. So it's another revenue stream that you can get from a rapid response electrolyzer that you can't otherwise achieve. And, and that's why PEM is particularly useful for a power to gas application. Simon, um, we're always talking about the surplus energy, the surplus energy from renewables, but uh, to take a closer look at the usage of electrolyzers, you can't only run them when they're surplus energy, you have to run them 24-7, uh, don't you? So, so make this uh, a real investment that counts, isn't it? Yeah, that, that, that's right. It's, um, it, it would be very difficult to generate hydrogen via an electrolyzer that's lower cost than reforming natural gas. And so it's necessary to be able to perform some extra services with the electrolyzer. Um, so you do need to make sure that you have um, a, a solid offtake for the hydrogen so that you can keep the utilization as high as possible. 
And that's why refinery applications are particularly interesting because they're effectively a bottomless pit for hydrogen. They always need more hydrogen. So you can exercise all of the other load balancing and grid balancing services in the background to generate some revenue um, while continuing to offset natural gas uh, that would otherwise be used. So it's a, it's a case of stacking all of these different things on top of one another so that the overall business case makes, makes sense. But then, to be honest, you can, can, cannot really talk about green hydrogen then. It's just uh, as green as the electricity is green already. Well, that, that's right. And we, but we do, um, we do have, um, uh, in some cases, we're connected directly to renewables. Um, we're doing that um, in, in the UK and we'll be doing that in, uh, in Holland as well. Um, but where that isn't available, we would have a, a green electricity contract. So we would be sure that the electricity we were using was derived from a, um, from a green source. Yeah. I would like to give you the opportunity to ask your question to Simon. If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. Obviously not. So, oh yeah, there's one question. I just come to you. Please introduce yourself and then tell us your question. Uh, Matthew Fairley, next hydrogen. I just wondered, uh, your 10 megawatt electrolyzer is going to produce a lot of oxygen. Is there any application in the refinery for the oxygen? Perhaps desulfurization? That, the, yes, Thank there you. is. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, that is one of the things that's being looked at in the project, and indeed other projects um, of, of similar scale. Um, the, uh, typically, our electrolyzer would operate under differential pressure. So that means that the oxygen would be generated at low pressure and the hydrogen at high pressure. And we do that for a number of reasons to do with cost and, and compliance and the overall safety case. But we have already taken the step of being able to um, demonstrate that the oxygen side of the system can be pressurized also. It does present some uh, engineering challenges, but that uh, can be done. You need to look at the, some purification for the oxygen as well, so you need to dry it, take out trace amounts of hydrogen. But you're absolutely right, a, um, uh, the refinery does use large, large volumes of oxygen very routinely, so uh, it, it is another revenue stream. Thank you for that question. Any other question from your side? Yes? Yeah, hello, Norbert Wale from Air2E. We are using um, PTL, so refined um, or renewable fuel for operating business aircrafts. How do you plan also to go, because Shell is doing usually crude oil business, don't you plan to also use it in some way to produce hydrogen and then a further step, renewable fuels out of it? Thank you. Yeah, that is, um, that's something that um, Shell and other people are interested in. Um, this project isn't going that far in, in this stage, but there are a number, of, um, a number of projects that are being looked at that are doing just that, um, where you can um, use other processes to synthesize existing fuels. Perhaps the simplest one is, um, is to um, uh, the methanation processes, but there's also um, the production of ammonia, and there are um, uh, plans out there to go much further than that. This project isn't going that far today, but it's something that I would expect Shell to have a, a view on over the, the, the coming years in the project. But it's a good question because it makes clear we won't uh, all run on hydrogen in the end. Uh, our mobility, part of our mobility will need syn fuels and there hydrogen is an important part. Yeah, and hydrogen is a very important building block in industrial chemistry. So um, electrolysis is a, 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 an extremely valuable tool for generating hydrogen in a clean way. And it's got flexibility in terms of how it's operated. It's industry knows how to handle hydrogen in large volumes at various pressures. So I, I do believe that electrolysis is a very uh, important technology for the future. Mm -hmm. Did you ever uh, have, have measured how much the hydrogen will cost uh, that you produce uh, in this uh, refined project? Uh, uh, well, let's say, well, the, the electricity is zero. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. But how much would be a kilogram of hydrogen be then? Yeah, that's... That is a, um, you, you're absolutely right, the majority of the hydrogen cost is down to the electricity uh, mm -hmm. price that you're right. using. So it's, um, it, it's, it's going to be down to Shell how they procure the, um, uh, the electricity in this particular project. The efficiency of the system would be in the region of um, uh, 
high 40s to um, uh, mid 50s kilowatt hours per kilogram. So that's a, a useful measure to be able to understand how many kilowatt hours of electricity do I need to generate a kilogram of hydrogen, and you can work out the cost per kilogram from that. So if you use something like 50 to 55 kilowatt hours per kilogram, per mm. kilogram that's a good measure for the, uh, the hydrogen cost. Very good. Simon, we're running out of time. Uh, 20 minutes are already over. It was very interesting talking to you and uh, about this uh, megawatt project, project 10 megawatt project, which is also funded by the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking. We should mention that uh, 10 million euros they, they give for that project. I would like to thank you very much for this interesting uh, talk here on stage. And I would like to thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. And if you want to find Simon, it's just over there. You can see the big booth of ITM Power and also their electrolyzers just around the corner. So next interview will be here in one minute time with Dr. Uwe Köhler. He is head of research and development of Nila Battery and they will talk about nickel metal hydride batteries when safety matters. So please stay tuned here. Thank you very much.